Our next speaker comes to us more locally, I believe. Uh, Jesse Burks Abbott is a librarian, <coughs> writer, public speaker, and self-advocate. In addition to working as a library assistant for Harvard College Library, and a reference librarian at Newbury College, she also sat on the board of the Twin Cities Autism Society, which is St. Paul, the Asperger's Association of New England, which is now the Asperger's Autism Network, and the steering committee of the Advocates for Autism of Massachusetts. Currently, Giossi is on the Board of Directors of Autism Housing Pathways, and he's a committee member of the Bedford Cultural Council. He also serves as an advisor to the Advocates for Autism in Massachusetts. Giossi received his master's from Simmons College in 2001. Along with evaluating the autism collection of the Cambridge Public Library, a major highlight of Giossi's library education was examining the potential new digital technology have opened up in yeah, I can't read. The potential new digital technologies have to open up the information universe to people with different learning styles. Joss is looking forward to two days of intellectual communion with fellow librarians and autism advocates. And I'm not totally crazy, but since I'm from Boston, Harvard is local to me. So welcome to Joss. <laughs> anyway, um, I guess today I'm supposed to be talking about um, autism and civil rights. And what is a corollary to civil rights is an egalitarian society in which everyone is treated as equal and they come together not in terms of a hierarchy, but in terms of uh, equality. And I'll say the LEND program, um, my experience at LEND as a fellowship, was actually uh, in close to actually creating a, what I call an egalitarian society. Now let me tell you a little bit about that. LEND stands for Leadership, Education, and Neurodevelopmental and Related Disabilities. It's a national network of graduate level interdisciplinary training and treatment programs located within university hospitals or medical centers. There are 52 LENDs covering 44 states with an additional six states and three territories reached through program partnerships. LENDs are administered by the Maternal and Child Health Bureau of the Health Resources Services Administration, an agency of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. LEMS are also part of a network of university centers for excellence in developmental disabilities established in 1963 and now subsumed under a larger network of Association of University Centers on Disabilities. It's a complicated structure, but it's a simple commitment. For the Maternal and Child Health Bureau, it's an America where all children and families are healthy and thriving and have a full shot, a fair shot, at reaching their fullest potential. For the Association of University Centers on Disability, it's a future in which all people, including those living with developmental and other disabilities, are fully included, participating members of their community. Massachusetts, part of UMass Boston, Institute for Community Inclusion, whose mission is to support the right of children and adults with disabilities to participate in all aspects of their community. There are two LEND programs in Massachusetts, one at the East Candy Shriver Center Medical Center and the other at Boston Children's Hospital. I was at the one at Boston Children's Hospital. It was a well-rounded education. There were <coughs> weekly lectures supplemented by readings, and these covered topics as diverse as audiology, as different types of disabilities, as the vestibular system, psychology, psychiatry. Um, there was field work in which we did home visits to see people outside the clinic. We did volunteer work with different community organizations. We interviewed um, state agencies about what they do. Um, oh, we, did, we did also did observations in the clinic. We actually have to watch doctors do their work. And there were group presentations, and then there was what I call the highlight, the Disability Policy Center. <coughs> and it was an eclectic classroom. It was interdisciplinary. There were medical students, there were law students, there were occupational therapists, there were physical therapists, there were pediatricians, there were psychology grad students, it was culturally diverse. There were people from different 
different countries, different ethnicities, different religious backgrounds, there are graduate students as well as career professionals, and there are people with disabilities and their families. And basically, we all came together and we're all equal. It didn't matter how, how much education you had, it didn't matter where you were in your professional career, we basically all were on the same footing, we were peers, and we were all learning together, and we are also learning from each other's different perspectives. You know, the civil rights leader, Doug Du Bois, had this concept of a double consciousness. And what he, what he meant by that is he described it as the peculiar position that African Americans are in, having to see the world both from their perspective and the perspective of the dominant white society. And I've always taken that, uh, I've always borrowed that, that the, the double consciousness, in terms of being autistic. That in essence, I see the world as being an autistic, but also as being non-autistic, because I'm basically in a normal, neurotypical environment. Now, just to clarify something, someone once asked me, does that actually mean you have a triple consciousness because you're black and autistic? I explained, well, that's a good question, but actually I don't think it's about numbers, it's just about anything that enables you to see the world for more than just your own little bubble. And I'll say, for instance, like a lot of the <coughs> parents I work with, um, who are my colleagues, who um, are the committees I'm on, they have autistic children, I would say they have double consciousness, because they have to see the world from their child's perspective, as well as their own. And I would say that that's what the Lent Fellowship, to a certain sense, was doing. It was sort of imparting a double consciousness on these professionals who are usually in their little silos, but it was actually expanding their horizons by showing them other ways of looking at the world. And so we all came together, like I said, and we basically learned together. Okay, on autism and civil rights. Other than operationalizing complete <coughs> inclusion, I would say three takeaways from my land fellowship that are relevant to civil rights are, I would say, three principles. Probably more, but I'll just highlight three. The paradigm shift from the medical model of disability to the social model. The medical model is, is looking at disability as a defect within the person. They can't hear, they can't see, they can't read, they can't walk. Whereas in the social model, it looks outside the individual to the barriers that are erected by society that actually are not, that actually make the person's problems worse and that can be <coughs> ameliorated. And then there's a the move from institutionalization to community inclusion. And then there's disability treated as a protected class like race and gender in anti-discrimination legislation. Now over almost the almost last half century, a lot of, uh, there have been a lot of landmark, landmark uh, legislation. This is by no means an exhaustive list, but just a sampling. Beginning in 1973, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act prohibits discrimination against people with disabilities in programs receiving federal funds. 1975, Education for All Handicapped Children's Act, later renamed IDEA, which is Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, mandates a free and appropriate public education for all disabled children. 1990, Americans with Disabilities Act prohibits discrimination against people with disabilities in employment, public accommodations, and public services. In 1999, the U.S. Supreme Court Olmstead decision rules that unjustified segregation of people with disabilities constitutes discrimination and violation of Title II of the American Disabilities Act. And then 2014, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, final rule, mandates that federal funds used for home and community-based services must be in the most integrated sense. I had a throwback Friday. One of the lectures actually took me back to the last time that I was able to do any kind of inter real interdisciplinary work, and that was when I was in college. I double majored in English and psychology. Since then, I've pretty much been focused when I was not dealing with libraries, pretty much on autism. But this was a lecture on a developmental trauma, and the presenter refers to Judith Herman's Trauma and Recovery, a book I used in college as a source for a paper on PTSD in Tony Morrison's fiction. It turns out the presenter, like me, double majored in English and psychology. He reads my paper, which leads to a brief email exchange, which, I mean, what's interesting is as much as being a Lent Fellow actually reaffirmed my love of interdisciplinary work and brought me back to what I consider my interdisciplinary roots, it also gave me a desire to focus, actually. So like now I feel like I'm more focused on public policy and disability. It still might be as broad as possible, so it's almost like I'm a wide, wide-angled lens that faces in one direction. 
And it turns out that this presenter was also the head of the uh, Lyme Clinic, the Autism Clinic at Boston Children's Hospital. Or, um, like I said, one of the things we did is we observed, we observed people being evaluated in the clinic. And I observed the evaluation of an autistic boy whose history is remarkably similar to my own. Granted, he was less than five years old, so he didn't have much of a history. However, like me, he had been kicked out of a Montessori school, which I just really found interesting. And, but his, uh, his parent was there. His parent accepted the diagnosis, but his parent felt that he was outgrowing. He was outgrowing his autism, but the testing was not showing that. And I resist the temptation to step from behind the observation mirror and reveal myself. There are different perspectives on whether I did the right thing. My neighbor at the time thought I should have made myself known because I would have been an inspiration. Wherein my faculty advisor uh, that I said I did the right thing, I should have stayed back because I was there as an observer, not a participant. For my part, I considered that what if I had made myself known and it had backfired? What if he had, so Karen had taken a look at me and thought, he's 45 and he's still autistic? I mean, so, but basically, this, this was sort of almost like just a lesson in keeping a professional distance. I mean, in essence, which is actually the way to prevent burning. In other words, to have sort of have that distance, because as much as you should get into a field or into a profession because you have a passion for it, because you like it, you still have to maintain a certain de distance if you're going to be, you're going to be effective. Um, and then I had a lesson in, in perspective um, when I did my family visit, my home. First, it was a role reversal for me, who has hosted students as part of the Ark of Massachusetts Operation House Call. And I didn't go by myself. I went with a classmate who actually has a child on the autism spectrum. And it's interesting how we saw things a bit differently. We noticed different things. I was struck by how normal life can be, even for the aging mother of adult twin daughters with ID and severe cerebral palsy. Basically, we went to this woman's house twice, and basically we just sat in her living room, had a nice chat, basically even talked politics a little bit, current events. Um, but as my classmate pointed out, the surface of serenity hides a tendency towards denial of self-care. So it's just interesting how two different people, you know, a parent and a person, you know, could approach things in two different ways. And it's important to have those different perspectives. And that, since that's what the purpose of the family visit is, is to sort of get you to not just see them in, in the hospital or in the doctor's waiting office, but to actually see them out in the community where they live and to actually and see them as, as full human beings. Speaking of being out in the community, I had my community service project, my community service volunteer work. And I picked the Threshold Alumni Program at Leslie University. The Threshold Program at Leslie University is a non-degree college program for um, students who are, would not be able to make it through a traditional um, college curriculum. But they get to be on a college campus and they get to learn life skills and even get to take some college courses. And um, I actually chose this program because of my own um, un un unconventional um, educational history. Um, I actually, um, I started in mainstream school. I started <coughs> when I was in kindergarten, then I was put in special ed. Um, when I was in first grade, I was in special ed until third grade, then I was uh, um, partially mainstream. During this time, I was diagnosed with autism residual state, but basically it was considered that I had a learning disability. Then finally, when I was 17, I was diagnosed with autism. And that was actually around the same time when the autism spectrum was sort of born in the United States because it was 1991, and it was the year that uh, Hans Asperger's work was translated into English to be in the United States. So it was considered that I probably had Asperger's syndrome. But I was diagnosed with autism finally um, because Asperger's syndrome didn't make it into DSM-4 until 1994. Anyway, I missed a lot of high school. So I wound up getting my high school diploma while I was at community college, um, while I was also taking college courses. And because of my imbalance of skills and deficits, I was like an honors English, but I was in remedial math. So anyway, I really wanted to be a part of this program because I thought I'd really identify with it. And as you can see from some of the activities, the dance class, the music group, the book club, you know, different than, let's say, a generation or two ago when people with intellectual and developmental disabilities would have been off, would have been <coughs> in institutions and allowed to stagnate, these people are brought into the community and they're engaged and intellectual activities and life stimulating activities, and they're actually a part of the community. And um, so, like, we had a dance class in which we learned um, different um, numbers for different Broadway shows. We had a music group, which was actually a collaboration, excuse me, with um, 
Harvard University, uh, their choral society, in which we uh, sang together, rehearsed together. And then there was a book club, which I was attracted to because I loved to read. And I was really excited that these people, even though they're intellectually disabled, did not mean they're not intellectually curious. So I was, um, so I was a little disappointed, to tell you the truth, when I went to my first book club meeting, and they hadn't finished the book. They couldn't get through it. But then I had to remind myself that I wasn't always a reader. I mean, I was raised by an academic in a house of books. <coughs> I mean that both literally and figuratively. And uh, something Chantal said earlier about uh, you know, her, her son, Jeremy, looking at books and holding them, I was like that too. Because in essence, to me, books were a valued object. I would always take books from my mom's shelf and look at them. Um, but I never really read them. I wasn't, in, I wasn't in love, I didn't love to read. The tumblers didn't really fall into place for me until my late 20s, early 30s. But when I was these kids' age, I wasn't much of a reader, even though I wanted to be. So in a way, I did identify with them. I knew where they were coming from. But, inverse to that, as much as I thought I could identify with them, I had to learn that they may not be able to identify with me. And that's what actually came in inadvertently through my faculty advisor, who said that I should give a presentation to these alumni, because I'm 20 years into my adulthood from where they are, and I can be a role model. The head of the program, who knew these students better, because she, she, she actually even does some of the paperwork for them, she said that actually that probably wouldn't work because they're in a non-degree program, and me having a master's of science would make them feel bad about themselves. So she came up with what I would call an equitable solution. She teaches a class in uh, uh, social work and case management. So she had me team up with an alumni, and on an equal, completely equal footing, we both went into the classroom, and we both talked about our experiences with the mental health profession. So then I have my group project on autism where I collaborated with classmates from different cultures, two of whom had children on the autism spectrum. We were talking about awareness and education, and because uh, two, two of the, my classmates came from different countries <coughs> and were part of different immigrant communities, we talked about the view of disability in different immigrant communities or programs in different countries. Um, two of the people were um, the parents of children, so they talked about the school system, talked about learning disabilities, special education. I covered adulthood, and um, I was able to share part of my story with my learned colleagues, and I'm going to share part of that with you now. And it begins with what I call Autism's Catch-22. Autism is recognized as a lifelong condition, and autistics have a normal life expectancy. However, at age 22, autistics transition from the educational system to the adult services system, where the continuation of services is not guaranteed. When you're in the adult services system, you're left with what I call the ABCs of autistic adulting. You have, at least in Massachusetts, you have the DDS, the Department of Developmental Services, which deals with group homes and, uh, and day programs. You have the Massachusetts Rehabilitation Commission, which deals with uh, vocational training and employment. And you have the ABLE, A-B-L-E, Achieving a Better Life Experience which are those special accounts that you can open to hold money aside that will not be held against you in terms of uh, your, your social security, your benefits. And then you have MAIC, the Massachusetts Inclusive Concurrent Enrollment, which is similar to the Leslie program except it's public as opposed to private. And um, other than the ABLE accounts, which anyone can open, these other things are pretty much contingent not only on available funds, but also on your perceived level of need. And in my experience, um, as much as these um, DDS and MRC you know, claim to be able to deal with the whole spectrum, they usually were not able to deal with someone like me by the master's degree. Now, in fairness to them, that was about I mean, 10 or 15 years ago. I've heard things have changed and things are better. But that's how it was, let's say, in the, the early 2000s. And that's why my mom, who I mentioned earlier was an academic, she was actually in the humanities, no sciences, really. She was, uh, her PhD was in English, um, and her specialty was African American literature and film. But later she wanted to change, um, she wanted to make her a director, she wanted to be an administrator, so she went to the Harvard Graduate School of Education. And she started taking courses in a qualitative interview. And she interviewed me about my autism, and she wrote an article about me that was actually published in an anthology of other academics writing about their personal experiences or the experiences of loved ones with disabilities. And we were actually going to write a book together in which it was going to be a book-length version 
of the, of the interviews that she had done. But in the meantime, we were also collaborating on a series of presentations that we would give around the country, like at the Autism Society of America conference, different places, in which we would give <coughs> dual presentations, one from her perspective and one from my perspective. And at one of these presentations at the Lori Center, which is uh, the satellite of Massachusetts General Hospital that, that focuses on autism, my mom said the following. I cherish the sometimes joyous, sometimes torturous moments I shared with Jocelyn, providing mom with them. Wearing a headscarf to waylay his affectionate, excruciatingly painful, vice-like grip on my hair, or teaching him not to walk like a duck or talk like a robot. And I consider myself lucky that bereft of precedent, I could change his prognosis from a mentally retarded individual, unable to graduate from sixth grade, to a man whose academic achievements pale in light of his generosity of spirit. At the same time, I know his strengths as well as his weaknesses. So even though Jocelyn can currently present on the higher end of the autism spectrum, like every parent of a developmentally disabled adult, I too agonize over what's going to happen to him when I age out and no one's there to take my place. That was in 2015. Two years later, in 2017, my mother was diagnosed with lung cancer and given six months year to live. Fighting cancer. Fighting cancer edges out autism as a focus of our collaboration. <coughs> Roles are reversed as my mother becomes the designated patient with me uh, being the closest family member. My autism was actually only considered in, in reference to how it would impact my ability to be there for my mom. So for instance, when things became pretty bad, and unfortunately that prognosis of six months to a year did come true, she was diagnosed in March, she died in September, um, and she wound up in hospice. We were given a double room, and I was, I was her roommate, and they would feed me regular food while she was on a liquid diet. Um, my mother's condition deteriorates too quickly for her to plan for my future. Fortunately, she had long since some things in motion. I would later learn she had a life insurance policy on me, but also um, uh, she had always encouraged me to be a, a self-advocate. In fact, actually, when I was in college, she was the one who encouraged me to study, psycho uh, to study autism as part of being a psychic, which actually has led to a lot of my professional activities today and a lot of my sense of, of self and sense of purpose. But she also encouraged me to do things for myself. Like I always helped like, with cooking and stuff and chores. It's just as she got weaker and sicker, I was just doing more to the point where I was actually cooking for her. And, um, but she also always challenged me to go out of my comfort zone, to try new things, to take risks. Um, uh, she didn't believe in limits, really. And, um, well, if there's anything that's going to force you to think outside the box, it's having the box you've been living in ripped from you. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't alone. It takes a village. One of my aunts stays in our apartment while I'm in the nursing home with my mother. My other aunt arranges for my mother's life insurance policy to be transferred into a brokerage. Friends and colleagues from my various associations helped me clear out the apartment and downsize. The apartment complex where I live decides to hold an affordable housing unit aside from me after reading my mother's obituary in the weekly paper. A year later, I'm living on my own. This is not the first time I've lived on my own. This is the first time without my mom's support. Enjoy a sense of community. They say that when, in times of need, you really find out who your friends are. Well, it turns out that people who I just sort of saw as colleagues and acquaintances because we were on town committees together or because we were on the board of the same autism organization, they actually showed themselves to be real friends. You know, I mean, they actually helped me out. They drove me places. They helped me downsize, like I say, you know, they came to my mom's funeral and stuff like that. And, uh, and, and, and carrying on my mom's legacy, that book I mentioned to you earlier, I actually finished it, The Rough Draft. Um, one problem that I've been told is that I shouldn't end it with my mom's death. I need to continue it with what happened after so that I can really give hope to all the parents out there who are, have the same fear about what's going to happen to their kid after they die. And actually, this is one brief example. I'm actually where my mom would, would have wanted me to be, and that was actually not a foregone conclusion. When my mom first got sick, well, she had me apply to the Bedford Housing Club, and they put me on eight to 10-year waiting. But she had actually wanted me to be in affordable housing in the apartment complex we've been living in since 2008. But my income, which was only long-term disability for my job at Harvard and Social Security, I was under the income limit 
for affordable housing. So that was, that was sort of a no-brainer. That was, that, was, that was a no-go. Um, and I was not going to be given privilege, even, even if I, because I was a resident. So that was, that was, as far as I know, was going to be the best. Well, and the Bedford Hard Housing Authority was an eight to 10-year waiting list. But somehow that waiting list shrunk exponentially. And let me say, I applied in April, and by August I had an apartment with Bedford Housing Authority. But then my mom dies in September, and like I said, the uh, apartment complex changed their mind. And it was because of my mother's death. It was because it, well, I invited them to the funeral because they were, it was a community thing. And also they read the obituary and decided to look at my case with empathy. And so they had me apply for the affordable housing. And um, of course my income did not, I came up short, but they did make an exception. They said if someone agreed to have my back financially, they would let me move into the apartment. And my aunt, the same aunt who put my mom's life insurance policy into a brokerage account, um, she agreed to have my, she signed the papers to have my, my back uh, financially. And so actually, I'm exactly where my mom would want me to be. I'm uh, not only in affordable housing, <coughs> community, but I'm also giving presentations at the conferences. So, yes. And I'm also finding something to do by the way I'm on. Understanding my mom in a new way. Remember that double consciousness I uh, told you about earlier? You know, autistic, not autistic, lack, not <coughs> Well, now I actually think, find myself thinking like my mom and me. Like that dual perspective I told you about where we give presentations, you know, from the parent's perspective and the person on the spectrum's perspective. But I realize that I, I have my mom's thoughts sometimes. You know, even like when I'm watching TV, I'll have like a reaction to something. And I realize that's not my reaction, that's my mom's reaction. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, I always like to, uh, to joke that I realized I was an adult when I turned 30, and my psychiatrist yeah, at the time was still 29. <laughs> it's a developmental milestone. They don't warn you about when you're older than the car you figure. Well, how about the rites of passage of losing a caregiver, especially when you have to become a caregiver of that caregiver? And in essence, the Len Fellowship was very much a rites of passage. I mean, we basically were taken through all the steps of being a professional in, in the neurodevelopmental disability field. And we had to go through these steps and we had to pass them. And, uh, so it was a rites of passage. And um, so, one thing that you learn, you learn about yourself, you learn who you are and what you are. So defining the self and self-advocate. And I thought, well, there was one lecture. It was uh, leading from where you are. And this nice quote from John Quincy Adams. If your actions inspire others to dream more, learn more, do more, and become more, you are a leader. Of course, on face that makes sense. Leadership is not about um, your title or your position. But what I also like about this quote, it also suggests you also don't always have to be out in front to be a leader. You can be sure. someone like me who tends to sort of hold back, be reserved. But still, if, if you inspire people, if you influence people, you can still have an impact on the world. You know, it kind of reminds me of like a, what I've learned about assertiveness. I'm usually, I usually don't like conflict, but I've learned how to be assertive without being confrontational. In essence, to quote another president, I can speak softly and carry a big stick. Okay, then one of the things we did at Land was we uh, did the myers Brick, which actually I had done in 2012. And um, so I thought I knew what my type was, and that was an INTJ. And that's an I for introvert, N for uh, intuitive, T for thinking as opposed to feeling, and J for judgment. Um, at least that's what I thought, and that's why I call this the curious incident of the Myers-Briggs mix -up. Because when the facilitator was going through the letters, everything lined up perfectly until we got to the J versus the P. The J is the judge, the one who likes to plan everything out, the one who likes to make lists, and the P is the person who is distracted by everything, his thoughts are always meandering, and when he was describing the P, I realized he was describing me. And I just thought that was really bizarre. Not because the Myers-Briggs is gospel, but it didn't make sense to me why the first three letters would be perfect and the last one would be so off. So I looked back at my 2012 results, and what I discovered is that my I, my N, and my T were all strong or very strong, whereas my J was only slight. And that's when I realized what happened. I was raised by a J. My mom was a consummate planner. Everything was beautiful. She's always believed in the power of making lists. My inclination was not that. I was always meandering, I was always all over the place. So now I had to decide, you know, can I sort of shoehorn myself into being a J, or can I make being a P work for me? Kind of right. 
It kind of reminds me of the, uh, the dilemma I face like when I have the neuropsych testing. I always come up like so high in verbal ability, but so low in visual spatial. And I've been told that I should focus on my visual spatial, don't worry about the, I'm sorry, focus on my verbal, don't worry about the visual spatial. Well, I kind of like to believe that maybe I, I can maybe make there's a balance of both. Especially coming here, lab yesterday, trying to make it through the airport, I definitely need that visual spatial. But, but and also even in terms of verbal, I mean, you need to be able to organize your thoughts. But it was just interesting, you know, having, having a nature, but then having how you're raised and trying to combine the two. And, um, I don't know what that was interesting. Um, I'll actually want to do this first. Uh, then we had what I would call the, the major part of the Lyme Fellowship, and that was going to Congress, uh, going to Washington, D.C. for the Disability Policy Seminar. That's where we really got <coughs> our legislative advocacy chops. We were actually going to go on the Hill, and we were going to um, advocate for legislation that was important to us. Now, one piece of legislation that was important to the land was Autism Cares, because that's what funds land, and that's about to expire in September. And basically, so we prepared to go to D.C. because the <coughs> bills are important to us. I chose the Autism Cares Act. And uh, basically, I think it's pretty much summarized in its, its acronym of CARES. Collaboration between the CDC, the NIH, and other federal agencies through the establishment of the Interagency Autism Coordinating Team. Accountability to the public through re reports to Congress on the health and well-being of people with autism throughout their lifespan. Research into autism prevalence, etiology, biomarkers, comorbidities, and therapies. Education of healthcare professionals, people with disabilities, and members of their families through the sponsorship of leadership education, neurodevelopmental, and related disabilities programs. Support for families through the Autism Intervention Research Network on Physical Health, a national system of medical centers offering comprehensive care to children and adolescents with autism. And uh, I was advised that I should put a picture of myself on, this is the flower I gave out to my representatives, I was advised I should have a picture of myself that shows me as an important person, so that's why you see me, I'm speaking at an event. I'm actually, this is actually when I was co-hosting a year ago, um, Autism Awareness Day at the State House, which was put on by the Advocates for Autism in Massachusetts. And, um, but before we actually went to D.C., I had an opportunity to, I, I, there, there are nine representatives in Massachusetts and two senators. Most of the representatives had already signed on to co-sponsor the Autism Cares Act, so, but none of the senators had. It doesn't mean they were against it, because you know, I guess they gotten around to it. I actually had an opportunity to meet my particular representative, who represents Bedford, South Moulton, when he came to Bedford to um, uh, <coughs> be a Bedford Veterans Administration about mental illness. And so I introduced myself to Thank you for co-sponsoring you know, co the Autism Cares Act. And uh, while I was in D.C., I got an opportunity to meet with him. Well, not him, but with a staffer of his, and also the governor, uh, uh, James McGovern, um, a staffer of his, too, and, and, and the staffers of Senator Warren. Now, actually, um, we um, didn't, uh, well, anyway, um, after this one. First of all, I don't want to make the assumption that we all know why it's important to talk to Congress, how to talk to um, so I made this sort of primer, a citizen's guide to the of Congress. Why talk to Congress? Because while they reign, it pours. They're inundated with requests, demands, committee assignments, and obligations. And basically, you know, they have their own priorities, but they're finally supposed to represent the people. And that's why your story is their compass. It's their guide to the deluge of information overload. So you come up with a compelling story, a compelling narrative that captures their imagination about why a particular bill is important to you or a family member and why it should be a priority for them. But as prepared as you should go in, I mean, I have this actually all glossy. I had it printed out on the photo paper. You should also be prepared to improvise because you don't even, you, you probably know you're not meeting your representative. So basically, you don't know who you're going to meet. You're going to meet some staffer. But you don't even know where you're going to meet. It could be a well-appointed office. It could be the waiting room. It could even be in the hallway and just, in terms of me, I met, I met in a little point of office, and I met in my waiting room. I haven't had the privilege of being in the hallway yet. But, <laughs> um, but also, be ready to go off script. You don't want to go in there saying, like, Siri or Alexa. You want to have it talking to them. But you want to, you want to sort of riff. Like, actually, I went with the group that went to Senator Warren's office, 
And um, I had my talking points ready. I had my little nifty little handout and my talking points. But then uh, one of my colleagues said something that I thought was actually perfect. She said, maybe Senator Warren should consider um, highlighting disability as part of her campaign for president. And so that's why when it came my turn to speak, I said yes, because Autism Cares Act is an example of the government getting it right. I mean, I've, since I was diagnosed aut autistic of over 25 years ago, I've seen several different sea changes. Things aren't perfect, but there's a, lot of, there's a lot better in terms of awareness and education. And I think a lot of that is due to the federal funding of research and data collection. And actually, then I had a very fruitful exchange with some of um, Warren's um, staff um, after I got back home, and that's why you know you don't forget the follow up. Thank you. Not only is it just good manners, but it's a great way of continuing the conversation. And you know, and I, I got a promise that Warren or the <coughs> staffers are going to look at the autism. <coughs> now, as of a few days ago, before I came here, I checked, and Warren is not signed on as a co-sponsor. However, what I've noticed since the disability policy seminar in April. The number of senators who have signed on is steadily increasing. And that's why, even though the Autism Cares Act is scheduled to sunset in September, I'm confident that there's actually going to be a sunrise. Okay, well, at the Disability Policy Seminar, okay, there's me today going, and you can see I'm about to storm the castle. <laughs> um, at the Disability Policy Seminar, basically, it was we, that's where we got to meet Len followers from across the country, because they were all coming to DC, not only to take work, advantage of workshops, but also to advocate for bills that were important to them. And some of the things we did is, like, for instance, one thing we did is we celebrated the 20th anniversary of the Supreme Court, Supreme Court Olmstead decision I mentioned earlier, which led to deinstitutionalization. But then we talked about uh, what this actually means in real terms, in terms of how are people actually going to have functional lives in the community. So we talked about issues having to do with employment, health care, even got a, a success story um, about two people who have grown up in an institution, um, were actually married now, for, they've been married for 30 years and they've been living outside the institution. We also talked about the intersectionality of race and disability and talked about the roots, the uh, roots of disability rights movement in the civil rights movement. In fact, this is an interesting note. In the Brown versus Board of Education during the oral arguments in the Supreme Court, one of the lawyers arguing against integration, he said, you know, what will happen if blacks and whites are allowed to go to school together, the next thing you know, mentally retarded people won't go to school. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, one of the lessons from D.C. was that what happens in D.C. doesn't stay in D.C. We need to come back home, go back home to our states, our towns, and we need to advocate there too. In my case, it included the day after I came back from the Disability Policy Seminar was um, Autism Awareness Day at the State House, which is put on by the Advocates for Autism of Massachusetts, which is a coalition of autism organizations that come together, uh, Massachusetts autism organizations that come together to advocate the State House and the Arctic of Massachusetts. And um, I was a time C at that event. And, um, and basically, as you could say, it's a microcosm of the Disability Policy Seminar because whereas the Disability Policy Seminar, you have stakeholders coming from across the country to descend on the nation's capital. In Autism Awareness Day, you have stakeholders from around the state descending on the state's capital. So, um, so yeah, I mean, uh, and um, so actually, so after we um, go over, so again, what happens in D.C. doesn't stay in D.C. So after we laid out some of our budget priorities for um, the Arc of Massachusetts and for AFAM, we actually sent out to the audience to talk to their own representatives and senators about what's important to them. And I want to end, I gave you that quote earlier from uh, John, um, John Quincy Adams about leadership. Here's a quote from his father, John Adams, about the nature of progress. I must study politics and war, that our children may have liberty to study mathematics and philosophy. Our children ought to study mathematics and philosophy in order to give their children a right to study painting, poetry, music, and architecture. So basically, we should always remember the debt that we owe to those who came before us, and we should always also remember the responsibility we have for those who come after us. Thank you.
possible to get a copy of your PowerPoint? Yes. And how would we do that? Do you have that printed out already? I actually do have a copy printed out. Um, yeah, and I'm going to put the PowerPoint um, uh, presentations on the Targeting Autism Resource page where you can access them. Oh, sure. Thank you. Hi, you said that you were going to, and you were not done writing the book, you were going to um, make the ending a little different, talking about the positive things happening in your life now. Do you have a timeline for that, or do you have a goal of what? I'd like to read the book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm hoping to finish it that this summer. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, just the beginning. What is your ethnic background, or what are you saying about that? Oh, well, I'm an African American. Hi. Have you ever considered? Um, doing a series on teaching others with autism that want to be self-advocates, how to be a self-advocate? Sounds like a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Every year, it's a co-sponsored forum by the ARC of the United States and AUCD, which is one of the organizations that Jossie mentioned earlier, the Association of University Center Disabilities, I believe, property. Uh, and that's a three-day forum in the D.C. area, in right downtown Washington. Two days are seminars and meeting, getting to know people, and the third day is dedicated to visits on the hill. Uh, so that's something for people who are interested. It really is a good time. You meet a lot of people. I got to go there twice myself. Uh, so it could be very influential for speaking. The other thing is that for those of you who are from Illinois, there is a LEND program here in Illinois. It's at the Institute of Disabilities and Human Development at the University of Illinois in Chicago. And there's a couple of people that will be here at the conference. One of them is Jose Ovalle, who will be speaking on one of the panels. And Jose is a graduate of the LEND program here at UIC. So with that, we're going to take... I have a faculty member there, so if anybody wants to get more information, let yes. me know. Pardon? I'm a faculty member at UIC. Okay. So if anybody wants to learn more about the program, please come find me and I'll put you in touch with you. Yes. Okay, we'll take a 15-minute break and then come back and get started again. Thank you.